All right, so our final panel today focuses, focuses on addressing risk at, risks and harnessing benefits of AI in healthcare through policy and practice. I'm so excited about this panel. Um, and I'm very excited that Dr. Daniel Yang will be moderating, and we have also asked him to share some closing reflections after the panel as well. So Dr. Yang recently joined Kaiser Permanente as our new Vice President for Artificial Intelligence and Emerging Technologies. And in this role, yes, people are clapping. We're very excited, yes. Um, in this role, he's responsible for ensuring oversight for all AI applications for the organization across clinical operations, research, education, and administrative functions. Before joining Kaiser Permanente, he was a program director at the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, where he founded and led a philanthropic program on diagnostic excellence. In this role, he helped establish several public-private partnerships to promote responsible use of AI in healthcare. He created infrastructure to support development, implementation, and evaluation of diagnostic AI algorithms. And he advanced research methods for evaluating clinical impact of AI in real world settings. Dr. Yang is also a practicing internal medicine physician and he completed his residency at UCSF and a fellowship in healthcare systems design at Stanford. Dr. Yang, I'll pass it to you. All right, hi everyone. Um, first of all, I'm really excited to, to just be here at this event, I feel like um, it's a homecoming in many ways. I'm able to connect with all my KP colleagues I've been seeing on teams in these little boxes and to see them in person is remarkable and really just understand the, the national impact and footprint of this organization. And two, I, I just see so many familiar friends and colleagues that I've gotten to know over the years um, in the audience, on the stage. Um, so for me, this is really kind of bringing these two worlds together uh, to talk about a topic that I think we're all passionate about, which is uh, ensuring that we're deploying AI in a way that's responsible. Um, I'm really excited to be joined on this stage by three people that I admire um, that bring complementary perspectives and expertise to this topic, particularly as we think about the risks and benefits of AI and what that means for policy and practice. The theme for the discussion is really how do we move from what we know we should be doing to actually getting it done. And so let me introduce my speakers. I'm not going to embarrass you the way that uh, Rebecca embarrassed me with my, my whole bio. Um, I'm just going to provide some, you know, uh, key bullet points uh, to provide context of, of where you're coming from um, and the expertise that you bring. So first, we'll, uh, we have Tom Romanoff, who is the director of the technology project at the Bipartisan Policy Center. Now, prior to working at BPC, Tom led IT initiatives for several federal agencies and advised executive leadership on the impact of new and emerging technologies on government operations. Second, we have Laura Adams, who is special advisor at the National Academy of Medicine, where she leads the development of an AI code of conduct. Prior to NAM, Laura was a president and CEO of the Rhode Island Quality Institute and has been a longtime expert in healthcare data interoperability. And last but not least, we're joined by Dr. Maya Hightower, who is co-founder and CEO of Equality AI, which helps data scientists develop fair and unbiased algorithms to eliminate discrimination in ML models. Prior to Equality AI, uh, Dr. Hightower was a physician executive at multiple academic medical centers. Most recently, she was EVP and Chief Digital Transformation Officer at the University of Chicago, and she was also the Chief Medical Information Officer at both the University of Utah and also at the University of Iowa. So um, just a quick note on how I plan to run this panel. It'll be slightly different than the last panel. Um, I'm gonna bring up each panelist to provide some uh, remarks, but as I'm bringing them up, I'm going to channel the thoughts and questions what I think the audience has in their mind. Um, and after, I, after each of the panelists finish their remarks, I'm going to open it up for the other panelists to kind of function as a quick reactor panel. And then after we get through each of their remarks, we'll just open it up to a more general moderated discussion and finally for an open Q&A. So, uh, Tom, uh, you'll be our first speaker. Um, and so as you're coming to the podium, here's what I think the audience is thinking about in their head. The current policy landscape for AI is messy. We've got guidance from the FDA on AI-enabled clinical decision support tool. We've got the final rule recently released from the ONC 
on predicting decision support interventions. We've got the White House executive order on AI. We've also got state level efforts. We heard about the California Attorney General letter. So can you help us clarify the current policy and regulatory landscape for health AI? What are the key issues? And what can we learn from AI policy approaches in other areas outside of healthcare and in other settings outside the United States? So Tom, please. All right, good afternoon. Some easy questions there. Um, and I will do my best to address them. But also uh, fully aware that it's after lunch, so if you need to take a nap or anything like that, uh, you know, I, I, won't, I won't fault you for it. But you know, just beginning with uh, you know, uh, who I am, I'm the director of the Technology Project, and to answer Dan's question about the landscape, um, it is messy. Um, we have seen a lot of interest in AI over the last couple of, uh, last couple of months, couple of years. Um, and, you know, in Congress, we're looking at around 43 different uh, AI-related bills. A number of executive orders that are up there uh, all apply to artificial intelligence. And we haven't even started talking about the state-level uh, legislation framework. Um, what we're seeing is that, um, you know, AI has, uh, has been around for a while. Uh, this, folks that have been working with this technology know that there's not, you know, there's new products out there, uh, but the technology itself is fairly known in a software development world. Uh, but there's new applications, and we're just now catching the attention of policymakers on how those applications are being used um, in ways that, uh, you know, frankly have some serious concerns. So when I say that AI is not new, uh, just to put it in context, okay? So in 1956, the concept about AI and the mathematical equation that um, led to what we have today was first conceptualized um, I'm not going to go through all of these, but you can see from 1956 to today, there's been a number of different advances. And it's always been that way with this technology, where the technology advances a little bit, and then people start to freak out. Are we having a superhuman intelligence? Is, how is this going to put everybody out of a job? Um, it also doesn't help that sci-fi uh, has oftentimes pointed to artificial intelligence as the, the villain, right? So uh, I can't get through an AI presentation without mentioning the Terminator. Um, and, um, you know, in some ways, you know, you can conceptualize a path forward towards, you know, uh, AI being able to um, do a lot that we think of as sentient, but uh, the clear path is not there yet. Um, and so whenever somebody asks, how many years are we away from superhuman uh, artificial intelligence, uh, I don't even put it on a time scale. Uh, but what I do want to say is that what we are seeing now uh, means that we can't go back to the way that things were pre-chat GPT or pre-large language models. Uh, the, the genie's out of the bottle, uh, Pandora's box is open, um, and um, you know, putting it also into context of where we were uh, on a global scale, um, you know, in the last two or three years, I pointed to state-level legislatures and some congressional AI bills that are out there. Um, you mentioned some of the healthcare-specific ones. But if you can see, there's been a lot of talk. Um, this graph goes all the way back to 2016 around how to strategize around AI, how to regulate it. Uh, 2016 is when a lot of the militaries uh, all agreed that uh, they would not use uh, autonomous weapons uh, against each other. Um, and some of those militaries included China and uh, the United States. Uh, but what, I'm, what I want to convey here is that um, no one's really pointing to these uh, agreements or these publications and saying, look at the history here. Look at how much we've already been thinking about AI. By and large, these are all forgotten. And I will put my organization's efforts in 2019, we put out a national strategy. No, no reporters are calling me up about the national strategy we put out in 2020. Uh, it's OK. I'm a little hurt by it, but it's fine. Um, and so, you know, when uh, one of the speakers was talking about how do we localize AI, I think this is a really good example because the other thing I want to convey is that, you know, AI is a reflection, in this case with ChatGPT, of language and how we use language. Um, it's, and language often has kind of that anthropological uh, effect of, you know, reflecting how, you know, certain cultures think or religions uh, practice or whatever it might be. So localizing AI is going to be exceptionally difficult because, 
Uh, on a global scale, we, we, we don't have common thinking about how to regulate this AI or what is a common definition of fair or what is a common definition of equity and access. And I say that as a pragmatic point of view, not as a um, kind of uh, general, you know, I, I can point to what I think of as fair in practice, but you know, I do realize and recognize that there's other definitions out there. And so uh, with that, I just want to also point out that, you know, we are in a new era, right? And um, so what is different now? Um, so this thing called Moore's Law, where you have exponential growth um, in compute and memory and all that fun stuff, uh, is leading to a lot of uh, what we're seeing in kind of these uh, incremental advances in AI. At the same time, if you look at the graph at the right, we're seeing uh, increased, uh, increased connectivity. IoT uh, devices are nearly universal in the United States, and they're growing. Um, they're expected to continue to grow through 2030. Um, and so we have a lot of data out there. And all that data is, from a human perspective, really difficult to recognize those patterns to, to create um, you know, predictions. But AI is an excellent prediction machine. That's also a really good book if you want to read something on that. Um, and um, it's also something that I, I like to convey is called exponential growth being very difficult for humans to understand. Um, and so while we're talking about this, uh, how to regulate and how to make it safe in, in healthcare, today it's already grown uh, by leaps and bounds. And exponential growth is a concept that humans just really can't wrap their heads around. Um, so, uh, you know, a lot of, so a good example again is ChatGPT. So when it comes to exponential growth, it's always, they're, they're finding new products for it. They're finding new ways to, to make it learn. Um, somebody mentioned about, you know, uh, having ChatGPT write a poem or whatever it might be. Well, the other example I want to use is ChatGPT, when it first came out, I don't want to know how many hands go up on this, but how many of you actually went in there and said, let me see if it can do my job a little bit better than, than I can do it, right? Let me see if it can write a outline for something I want to write or whatever it might be. And then you got the product and it wasn't that great. There was something you needed to go fix. And you're like, whew. I got another two years until the technology captures up and it's better than mine, right? But that two years is coming. Um, and, um, you know, what I like to say in terms of job disruption in this space is that um, what is cognitively very hard for human beings is very easy for AI to do, and vice versa. What's cognitively very easy for us to do is very hard for the AI to do. And so that's why you're starting to see people use it as a first draft and then go in and use their experience to try to... Um, build it out. Um, and along those, the, that point, Goldman Sachs came out with a really scary report, if you haven't seen it, uh, that you know, the current iteration of AI will raise GDP by uh, 7%, but it'll also impact over 300 million jobs over time. Whew, I only have two minutes. Let me hurry up. All right. So, uh, problem not solved. All right. So, what does this mean? So, if in, in the health equity space and, and, and this idea of um, you know, bi data bias, people have been working on this for a long time. If you are following the big data trends and how to use it in, in the medical space, uh, data bias was big in that. AI is kind of magnifying those issues. It's going to amplify a lot of that because it can do things at scale that we haven't been able to do. Um, and so along those same lines, and I tell this to policymakers a lot, is that if you cared about data, uh, data bias in the, uh, in the healthcare space or equity in the healthcare space or social safety nets to uh, mediate technology disruption, then you probably care about it as well in the AI space. Nothing has really changed there. It's just really going to continue to amplify. I'm hurrying up because I only have a minute and 20 seconds. Sorry. Um, so now getting into the policy conversations. Are the policy solutions justified in some of these scary things? Well, um, you know, we have, uh, policymakers have some bright lines that they don't want to cross. Uh, mis and disinformation in election space, um, you know, uh, making sure that it doesn't exagger exaggerate, uh, exaggerate uh, existing biases. Um, and um, in, the, in the context of that, we often find ourselves looking at what other countries are doing. So the European Union has been called the Silicon Valley of regulations, um, and that's because they're going ahead and they're going to go regulate. They put out the, the AI Act, um, and, um, and then in, in the United States, that has led to this debate around 
What do you do around innovation where, you know, inno folks will argue that innovation uh, can't thrive in regulatory environments. Um, but then what do you do about things like deep fakes and bias and jobs, job issues? Um, and then finally, at the same time, we're having this big debate on what competition with folks like China means. Um, and so all of these things are pieces that uh, policymakers are trying to put together. In the healthcare space specifically, uh, I'm going to run over a little bit if that's okay. Um, I just want to talk, you'll see that, you know, there's kind of two different worlds. Patients are scared of AI in some situations. Uh, they don't want to see it rolled out too quickly without the safety norms in there. Uh, but at the same time, healthcare is viewed as one of the biggest areas of disruption for this technology. Uh, one of the biggest opportunities for cost savings. Um, and so as you see these kind of um, these things play out in the industry, the idea of trust is really hard in this space because um, take, for example, facial recognition, right? Facial recognition is something that they rolled out in the UK specifically, and it did not do well with people of color or people of East Asian descent. Uh, it was very inaccurate. And that idea of AI, facial recognition is AI, being inaccurate persists today. Even though the technology has continued to excel, once you've lost that trust, it's really hard to gain it back. And when I say you've lost that trust in the facial recognition space, I like to say it's Kleenex versus facial, uh, facial tissues, right? Um, AI is AI to anybody who's not, you know, in this field practicing it. And so if there's some, a group that doesn't trust it because of the outputs that happen in facial recognition, they probably won't trust it in their healthcare space. And so the idea that we need to regulate across these things, it's dangerous because we see AI as kind of this one big thing that we need to, to, to tackle. Uh, but in reality, there's very specific industry um, considerations that need to be taken into account. There's some very smart people that need to step up in those industries to make sure that they are um, you know, providing the context needed for uh, AI in that space and how it's being used. Um, and so what I usually tell folks is you know, regulating by use case is really easy, but it's also really hard to do in terms of long term. and um, you also need to address these problems early. So with that, I've run over a little bit, and I would like to thank you. All right. So um, first, let me um, open it up for a reactors, uh, reactions from both Maya and Laura. So feel free to, if you have any thoughts that you wanted to provide, I'd uh, love to hear them. Yeah. How far away are we from some meaningful regulation? So comprehensive AI uh, regulation is something that uh, we talked a lot about last year with the AI innovation forums. Um, those have largely lost a lot of steam, um, and a lot of members on the House and the Senate side uh, have been given permission to engage folks on their committee specialization or their s bosses' specific areas of um, of interest, and that means that a lot of the AI legislation potentially happening will be around some of those use cases like mis and disinformation, deep fakes, things like that, instead of a comprehensive uh, type of uh, approach that, you know, potentially was being floated when they did the innovation side. Now, it's still not dead yet, but, um, you know, I don't see it happening in the 118th, and that's always dangerous to make <laughs> predictions about what Congress is going to do in this space, but. Uh, I think smart money is not in the 18th, maybe the 19th, but we'll continue to see states regulate in that space, including in the healthcare applications. You'll continue to see the federal government push out, uh, whether it be rule changes, executive orders. There's one that happened last week around um, privacy, which will have an impact on AI. Um, and uh, so you'll see that, see that. The problem with that approach is that um, with the executive order, uh, it's subject to a new executive coming in and saying they don't want to go that direction. And it's really expensive to change directions in this space. Um, and then at the state level, it's really hard to manage technology with the patchwork. Yeah, Tom, I thought you did a fantastic overview of that. And it does give us the sense of the complexity. And especially when we think about trying to harmonize this globally, because I think what we understand across the globe is that um, the threats don't stop at the border, and I think we don't want innovation stopped at the border either. So I think there's an incentive for us to get out and do that and to act 
collectively, globally. And I guess I would seeking some advice from you. I've just been asked to do a um, to chair a global innovations group out of a UK regulatory science and innovation network. There, uh, who would you invite to the table for a global innovations view to assist the UK and also cross fertilize for the rest of the nations? Uh, so. Um... I have specific names I'd be happy to talk to you about. Um, <laughs> I was hoping that was the case. But uh, I would say in terms of experts, uh, some of the biggest ones that I would... So standards and definitions are something that in the tech space, uh, especially when we're talking about harmonizing across international borders, uh, just doesn't exist yet for the AI. And so folks like uh, NIST and ISO, anybody who's kind of working on and has experience in trying to establish these technical standards, I think is critical it's, uh, speaking of after lunch, it's really boring, but it's critical to, to happen. Um, and so I'd invite that group. The other big one, I, I think, especially in this iteration of uh, technology and large language models, is the IP and copyright people. Uh, because OpenAI is getting sued every other week on these things. Um, and Google also has some pending lawsuits on that. And I just don't think they figured out what the technology's use of the data that it needs to consume means in the apparatus that we have is in terms of IP and copyright. And I actually think that's going to be long-term really difficult for scaling up the, the, the use and, and, and deployment of this technology. Great. And, and I love how in this uh, format, I'm actually outsourcing my job to, to the panelists. So thank you for asking great questions. Um, so let's move on to our next speaker, and we'll have an opportunity to dive deeper into all these topics um, uh, after your presentations. I wanted to bring up Laura Adams, uh, Senior Advisor at the National Academy of Medicine. And Laura, as you come up, uh, here's what I think the audience is thinking. So we just heard from Tom about the messiness in the policy landscape. If you take it one step down, there's also messiness when it comes to guidance documents, codes of conduct, um, uh, best practices um, uh, that are coming from both within government and outside of government. Just to give you a few examples, we heard about the NISC AI risk management framework. We have a, a trustworthy, um, sorry, blueprint for trustworthy AI from CHAI, a coalition for health AI. We also have some uh, guidance documents from the World Health Organization, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so, one, what do these guidance documents tell us? And uh, using a clinical example, you know, we worry about alarm fatigue in the hospital, particularly in a place like an ICU, where you just got beeping constantly going on, you just drone it out. Are we at risk for AI guidance fatigue? Um, you know, are we at risk of just hearing so much of what we should be doing um, that we just stop caring about it? Um, and so help me make the case for why the NAM AI code of conduct is going to cut through the noise and how it differs from these other efforts. Sure. Thank you so much, Daniel. It's such a pleasure to be here. I'm delighted to be able to have a, an opportunity to interact with all of you. I want to take that first question of um, what does it say that we're developing all of these? <clears throat> I think the good news on this front is everybody recognizes that there's enormous promise and there's also significant peril. So I wouldn't want to be rushing headlong into this thinking there's only an upside to it. I also wouldn't want to be focusing only on the downside. So I think the good news is that people are trying to make sure that AI does not break bad because we know that this would be a crushing blow to something so with so much promise for the future. On the other hand, I think because of these concerns, we keep seeing, and in fact, it was the genesis for the Code of Conduct project in the beginning as we were approached by people that said, gee, for crying out loud, every day we turn around, there's a new guideline principle framework that's put out. And so the good news is that everybody's putting out guidelines, principles, and frameworks. And the bad news is the same because we have now fragmentation, and in healthcare we have seem to have this penchant for fragmentation where we will go down our own silos. And as Julia said, Julia said earlier today, that idea of feeling we want to work in our own silo and get it right there without thinking of the impact on others in the system. And so the Code of Conduct project is, if we can think about harmonization of data standards, harmonization interoperability, why can't we think a little bit about governance interoperability? For me, it was so important when I was beginning to do the Living Laboratory in Rhode Island to see if we could link up all of the data sources there clinically and put it into a central repository. It was really exciting for me to be able to do that, but we knew we needed an ironclad privacy framework. So we worked with um, opponents like the ACLU and the Coalition Against Domestic Violence who came in and said, 
you have a breach in this system, it's like slitting a feather pillow in the wind. You'll never get that information back. So they were so interested in building an ironclad uh, privacy framework. So we did. And then I couldn't wait to share our data with the rest of the states in the nation. I turn around. We made out pretty well in the uh, AI, in the um, rather the High Tech Act. We got 27 million in 90 days in just our first three grants, and we were off to the races building our health information exchange. And so, but we spent way too much of that funding that we got on attorneys trying to reconcile privacy frameworks before we could either exchange any shred of data. So, can we think a little bit about what is that? So, the code of the Con code of conduct project was to take a look at. What are the commonalities here? What are we sort of in violent agreement on? Where are the gaps? What are the things we need to be paying attention to? But that's only the first element of the code of conduct. The other three elements that are, I think, critically important, maybe more than the harmonized principle sets, were can we distill this now into something memorable? Five or six commitments. Almost think of it like the 10 commandments, but not 10, just about six. We base that on complex adaptive systems theory. Well, we, began, we saw in that theory that very, very complex behaviors in the world are governed by very simple rules. We see that all the time. I saw it in quality improvement in my background, whether it was central line infections, we want to de decrease uh, perioperative uh, infection rates, whatever it was, it almost always boiled down to do about five things, do them consistently for every single patient, and you'll drop the bottom out of those complications. And so we started thinking, what are those six simple rules? So you'll see them come out on the 29th of this month in the Code of Conduct Commentary Publication for Public Comment. You'll see the harmonized principles. By the way, there's a heavy overlay with the learning health system. I think with AI, if we didn't think we needed the learning health system before, we know we need one now. Because this is an all-teach, all-learn moment. I was thinking about Judy's remarks and how she and I spoke at lunch, and she mentioned um, being a humble learner. And I think that ought to be our goal and aspiration for our own conduct and behaviors is being humble learners. We have a lot to learn, and we will for the foreseeable future. There won't be a time when I think we tackle this and we're done. So when I think about what it means, I want you to know who's behind the Code of Conduct. The CEO of Mayo, so um, we have Gianrico Ferrugia, is one of the co-chairs. Uh, Bakul Patel, who is the Digital Health Strategy Global Lead for Google. And Roy Jacob, who is the CEO of Royal Dutch Phillips in the Netherlands. And you'll see here on our AI Code of Conduct, if I can get this slide to change, um, I like to do this without names first to see how many faces you can recognize. I know that you're going to say, hey, there's Andy Beinman, Chief Medical Officer from Kaiser. Yes, there's Andy Beinman, and he even goes as far as not just to serve on our steering committee, but he's serving on one of our work groups that I'm going to explain a little bit about in a moment. But um, I'll give you a minute to take a look. That's um, Peter Lee from Microsoft on there, too. Eric Horvitz, also from Microsoft on there. Uh, Suchi Saria, brilliant mind in AI, just absolutely amazing. Grace Cordovano, one of the most articulate, outspoken, and effective patient advocates you'll ever come across. Um, I was astonished in watching Grace at our first couple of steering committee meetings because we might be talking along the lines of things, and we got insular and more insular and more insular. And she would make one or two statements, and everyone's head would snap around to what it meant to be. We were talking about something that was might be important, important to patients and families. And she cut through all of that by saying, listen, patients and families, family members, they want their family member to live. Patients, they want to live. They want to be able to raise their children. They want to be able to live out their lives. And in doing so, here's what they need, crystal clear. So I love this steering committee. I'll give you the names on it. You'll advance. There we go. So you can take a look at the, the names on the steering committee. We wanted Sanjay Gupta because we wanted to be able to get good communications advice on this. And what we're finding here is that we have strong equity and ethics experts that have guided our work every step of the way. We, too, are worried about workforce. Peter Mate and his work at IHI, uh, quality improvement. I'm looking across the landscape of those organizations that I'm interacting with now that are putting together their work on AI, and I think, hey, those of you that made investments in quality improvement, in plan, do, study, act, in that idea of small-scale tests of rapid change, you're way ahead. 
you made a smart investment because as we heard today, so much of the success of AI has to do with can you implement it in your own setting. So the Code of Conduct Initiative goals are that governance interoperability. We want to be able to, can we have a common language to start with so that we're not trying to reconcile all of these? And by the way, we do recognize that in working with these coalitions that we're working with, the NIST risk management framework, for instance, is a, an exquisitely well done document. It's 42 pages though, and if you are a sort of community health system CEO, and you're trying to look at that document for guidance, I might recommend, well, maybe I wouldn't go this far, but you might want a cardiac defibrillator nearby because you are going to have palpitations when you think, oh my God, there is no way I can put 42 pages of detailed requirements. I can't build that into my system. They're going to stop breathing. So we think that some of these publications are suited for some audiences, some are not suited for that. So we're working with a number of coalitions. The Coalition for Health AI, many of you know that that coincided today with their announcement of their board of directors. They're formally incorporated now. We're super excited. They're going to be putting together a network of certification labs for AI. We're excited at the National Academy of Medicine because they will certify to our code of conduct. So this is what it looks like when we begin to align. The most wonderful thing about us running a little bit scared about AI, at least having the wherewithal to know what we don't know, or at least have an inkling about what we don't know, is that we're coming together in big time, big ways to learn. We're doing more and more. I think about Steve Jobs' admonition to us about when we've got really difficult problems or we've got complex things to work through, the most exciting thing to think about here is collect as many dots as you can. The more dots you connect, the more dots that we can pull together and get general pictures and come up with creativity. So these are the groups, the Light Collective is that group of organizations that are rare disease advocates. They are the patient voices and they are helping us put together the translation of what this looks like when you take the code of conduct down to another level. We can't stop at the code of conduct. We've got to translate it into what does it look like from those perspectives so that we're creating an interstitium, a connective tissue, and we don't just proceed ahead without regard for each other. So that's what we mean when we're talking about the um, roles and accountabilities component of that. And boy, are the consumers giving us an earful. They're telling us exactly what those behaviors look like if you really are including them as patients. They're even developing a scorecard to say, you can score yourselves, and by the way, we want to score you as well. And the last thing that I'll say is that it translates it into behaviors. And then, once again, the other thing that we're looking at here is when I think of, of, of bias and my concern about a digital divide, another equity divide, I'm concerned not only that the algorithms are biased, but I'm concerned that those with the most resources are now galloping ahead. Most Americans get their care in mid-sized hospitals, in community health centers, in rural hospitals, critical access hospitals, in these places where they're not as well resourced. We want to, in this Code of Conduct project, describe what it means to build the resources in the center so that all of us can proceed, so that we don't, once again, prevent the patients being served by those entities from getting what it is that they need out of AI because frankly they probably need it more. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Laura. Always so eloquent. And while you didn't say it explicitly, I think one of the advantages of the NAM AI Code of Conduct versus these other efforts is having you. Um, and, uh, you know, really, you talk about being a dot connector, and I, I think you're one of the best dot connectors um, out there. So uh, appreciate your um, and the NAM stance of really being a humble learner and kind of building on the, the great work of many other efforts before it. So um, let me transition back to this uh, reactor panel model. Um, so Tom or Maya, feel free to, to ask your co-panelists or share any remarks. Uh, <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so I'm just curious about the, um, maybe I missed it, but the, the patient input side of things. Yeah. How, how are you capturing that? Oh, thank you so much for asking because I ran out of time and I wanted to be able to tell that part. Uh, the Light Collective is a collection 
of patient advocacy groups. And so they are in the middle right now. And I don't know that I mentioned that Daniel um, was the first funder in of five funders on our code of conduct. He saw the vision for it immediately. And California Healthcare Foundation, uh, Patrick J. McGovern Foundation, NIH, EPIC, all followed. And we were so pleased. You also funded a group called the Light Collective, and that's Andrea Downing, and she's a brilliant spokesperson <coughs> for patient advocacy. Uh, Andrea Downing found out that their um, BRCA3 breast cancer group that was putting together all of this um, uh, deep sharing going on on Facebook, that there was a flaw in Facebook that was allowing their very intimate information to be channeled to other sources. You know, we think of uh, Cambridge Analytica and places like that. She was the first one to discover that flaw. Andrea is no dummy. She's really smart in this field. And so what she has done with Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation funding uh, is to put together the guidebook for what it looks like when you are actively engaging us. So it's built upon, um, they did a patient-led research guidebook, which was for researchers to say, we're going to tell you all the different ways in which we want to be involved and be partners in research. We're going to tell you what it looks like when that behavior is poorly done. We're going to put it on a continuum until we can show you what it's like when you really do it extraordinarily well. They're doing the same thing for their AI rights and what they want their roles and responsibilities to be in governance of AI, in deployment of AI. And we're taking that guide and bringing it right into the code of conduct. <clears throat> so a section of our final capstone paper will be that application of what consumers have told us, this is how, these are the behaviors, these, this is what it looks like to apply this and to have us feel as if you've done us justice. I would just, I would just add, if Andrea was in the audience, the, probably the first thing she would say is uh, pay patient advocates for their time and attention. So we definitely want their input, but oftentimes we don't think about reimbursing them for their effort. Yeah, speaking of which, that was my question, is how do we then translate this lessons learned on amplifying the voice of patients on a, say, governance level to the very local um, health system level or even our uh, policymakers? How do they do that um, using that same capability? Yeah, I would mar uh, cite Mark Sendak's work out of, the, um, out of Duke University. He's got a collaborative governance model paper. Um, go get it. Look it up. Uh, S-E-N-D-A-K, Sendak, Mark Sendak, and Suresh Ballou also co-authored that paper. They have done one of the best pieces of work I've seen in actually bringing the voices of the local entities around. Because as much as I appreciate, applaud, and anticipate, and, and anticipate working with the Coalition for Health AI, we can certify a, a, an algorithm or a model at a certain level. <clears throat> we're almost, not almost, we're always going to need to take that same algorithm. All algorithms are local. All AI is local. And have it fit and tuned to the local environment. And that includes the local voices. We're working now with um, indigenous nations, and they have put together um, such ironclad principles about how they want their data used and done, how they want their artifacts regarded, adopted by the Smithsonian Institution. And so I want to see us begin to permeate all of the, the, when we write an implementation manual, when we write an implementation guide, I wanted to talk about not just what you in your own silo should be doing, but what you ought to be doing in relationship to the other people. And I want that written all the way through from the highest levels of governance down to the local community health center. But I think if we can help them develop those guides, give them templates and models for that, um, nobody knows their patient populations like some of these places like a community health center. They have some of the best opportunities in the world to make this and tune this toward the, the true patient needs. So I'd say that that's what we're looking toward and we've got a lot of work to do ahead, though. I understand that. All right, well, thank you. Um, so moving on to our last speaker, uh, last but not least, Dr. Maya Hightower, um, CEO and founder of Equality AI. So Maya, the question that I have for you is, um, you know, the theme throughout the day was really around uh, inequities and, and risk of algorithmic bias. We know it's a critical issue. We know it's an issue that uh, policymakers are aware of. But sometimes it can feel like there's this massive chasm between acknowledging the problem and actually doing something about it. So can you illuminate us on what policymakers, what health systems, what everyone should be doing to ensure that the AI tools we're using are fair and equitable? 
Absolutely. That's what I'm going to talk about today. It's about being pragmatic, really making sure that when you are implementing your AI systems, that you have a strategic alignment. And that strategic alignment includes health equity. So AI and health equity are not two separate silos or different parts of your strategy, but intertwined. And the second is really around governance. No matter where you are in your governance structures, you can actually repurpose your existing governance structure. You don't have to pull in you know, a ton of different experts as long as you use what you've got and then grow. So AI governance is extremely important. And then the third pillar is measurement. Whether you're using an, an external source to measure or internal capabilities, but you have to measure the impact of what you implement to ensure that you actually are achieving the outcome that you seek. So that's what I'll talk about, and <laughs> I'm gonna stand over there with my little <laughs> pointer, uh, because it's actually easier for me to, to stand over here. But I did want to, to, for each of us to take a moment and pause, and think about the last time you saw your doctor. The last time maybe a loved one was in a healthcare system. Maybe you were in an exam room and you had one of those you know, cute, attractive robes on that exposes your derriere. And your doctor was probably sitting in front of a computer, typing away, maybe now there's an ambient system. But how much did you trust that the AI behind the curtain actually was personalized for you? How much did you trust that your loved one in the emergency room or in the operating room, that the AI behind the curtain actually applied to their specific circumstances, the data, the personalization, their genomics, their labs. And for the vast majority of us, you know, given the right circumstances, we each are at risk of being an outlier. We are each at risk of not being in the middle of the bell curve that that particular model may have been trained on. And so that's why you know, making sure that we are measuring bias, that we are addressing, is so important because we have a long way to go. AI truly has the potential to be our pathway to personalized precision medicine if we do it right. We are at an inflection point. We've talked so much about the promise of AI already. Again, it really does have the opportunity to improve quality of care, drive down costs, and create these ex amazing experiences. A amazing experiences for our patients, amazing experiences for our providers. We just had the whole panel talk about how we're so close for the EHR actually to be a joy. Never in my career did I think that would be a possibility since I've spent my whole career wearing like a flak jacket when it came to the EHR. But to be so close, yet we have so much to do. When it comes to health equity, you know, Martin Luther King said it best, of all forms of injustice, in, um, in, inequity, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. And in the last 50 years, what have we done? Have we done anything since Dr. King said this statement? No, we continue to have the same inequities we had 50 years ago today. So do we have this opportunity with AI to instead of widening the chasm, to actually close it. And I do think we do if we implement our AI systems responsibly with health equity intertwined in our AI strategies. And the reason why we know that there is a risk of widening health disparities is because we have caused harm with AI already. We have widened disparities already with AI systems. Example, Obermeyer et al. You, many of you probably are familiar with the work of Ziad Obermeyer, but he was able to measure the impact of a biased algorithm that was de de deployed in hundreds of healthcare systems. Probably at this point has been calculated to have been exposed to 80 million people that decreased resources, case management to referrals to black patients compared to white patients. Black patients while being equally sick had 50% less referral rate for case management. The good news is that it was detected and mitigated. That we do have that, that capability of detecting a bias when it, within a model and fixing it. We no longer have to have a model be deployed to 80 million people 
or 80 million exposures before we recognize that harm has been done. And so bias occurs, and again, this is sort of repetition from earlier today. Um, we had that beautiful um, example in, um, from our, our colleague from Emory. But, but bias occurs across the AI life cycle, from those that have the ability to ask a question, so problem formulation. Not all problems have equal voice. If we ask our community members what is most important problem they want solved from AI, it probably isn't to, to improve the revenue cycle, <laughs> rev cycle management, or um, auto denials, right? But yet, that often is where a huge amount of AI resources are currently targeted, is in rev cycle, in cost reduction, in process improvement, which is also very important. But bias occurs from the moment of problem formulation to the real world data that is embedded within our EHR, to how that data is acquired, to the way that the model is developed. There are thousands of decision points in modeling in and of itself. In the Obermeyer example, the, the error that was created was called a labeling error. So they used cost as a proxy for, for risk. And we know systematically that African-American patients spend less healthcare dollars while being equally sick. And so that was the actual error that occurred. So that occurred during the modeling process. The data in itself, the data set, actually had plenty of, of um, higher quality labels that, would have that ultimately produced a better model. To the way that the model was evaluated and to where, how it's deployed. We had an example earlier today about you know, a punitive, a negative model versus a positive one, where a very neutral model on um, on AI, very neutral model on no-show prediction. You can either be punitive as a health system and double book, or you can be assist assistive as a health system and provide resources that actually addresses why somebody might be at high risk for no-show. So bias can occur throughout the AI lifecycle, and the great thing is that bias mitigation can occur throughout the AI lifecycle. And so when it comes to different mitigation techniques, we have a combination of social methods. So some of them do not require any technology in and of itself. You can start with diverse teams, with AI governance, you know, with um, our regulatory environment, with applying some of these principles that we've talked about by my panel members. All the way to more technical approaches where you can actually dissect the data set, you know, the, the model itself, uh, measure for precision and performance by subpopulation. You know, for that same instance of, say you go to the doctor and you wanna know if it's personalized to you, you can actually ask the folks at Kaiser for the performance of the model by subpopulation. We heard that this morning, which is fantastic. How do, is it accurate if you're African American? Is it accurate if you're Asian American, right? <coughs> And then the fairness of it. Are the distribution of resources equitable across subpopulations? Are the mammogram referral rates that this mo model may be triggering equitable? Does it match the demographics of the people that the pro that population is serving? So those are some of the very technical and can get way into the weeds on the technical approaches to bias mitigation. But what that leaves is this challenge, right? There's most when you talk to healthcare, when I talk to healthcare leaders, they're feeling this overwhelming sense of competing priorities. Where do I start? And that's really where, again, three simple steps. Your AI strategy, making sure that your organization is prioritizing what's important, including health equity. And with that roles, your AI governance, making sure you have an AI governance system in place, and then holding your AI governance system accountable through measurement. You can measure through an audit, you can measure through technical me methods. There's a lot of ways of measuring, but measurement is so important. So the way that we approach it at, at Equality AI is really helping health systems find that, that alignment um, it, by, by domain and making sure that their AI strategy really does align to what's important for that, health, for that healthcare system. 
And then AI governance, there's a lot of different uh, frameworks for AI governance. Personally, NIST and ISO, yes, it may be dizzying if you think 42 pages for NIST is, is extensive, what about the 200 pages for the ISO standard? <laughs> so, so it, but it, these are, there are more simplified versions. You just talked about Mark Sendax works, that is the Duke work over on that bottom right hand corner. And then um, Obermeyer at, at Al, Ziad Obermeyer has his own playbook, the algorithmic bias playbook that Booth um, U Chicago has published. And then the, the model, when you audit a model, you actually audit by two different methods, the technical approach, but also process. So did the model go through the AI governance process as it was intended? So we each have a role to play, regardless of, of what hat you wear. If you're a healthcare administrator, your role is to make sure that from the top, that your AI strategy includes health equity, that you're appropriately resourcing your teams to provide AI governance, policy, accountability within your system, and they're actually checking to make sure that those processes are working. If you are a doctor, if you're a clinician, it's being a part of those AI governance committees, making sure your voice is part of the solution. If you're a patient advocate, that you too are part of AI governance, and that your, your voice is being represented. If you are a policymaker, making sure that we have some guardrails, we have some foundation, because right now it is very confusing for healthcare systems. And so I'll just, the call to action really is straightforward. Again, AI strategy, aligning with your health equity goals, governance, and then measure. So, that's it. All right, so let me open it up. Laura, Tom. I loved it. Um, I have, uh, what I think I heard you say is that uh, AI is the problem and AI is the solution <laughs> yes. um, with regard to the, its ability to detect and uh, to help mitigate bias. So the very problem it's sort of, create. well, it's not creating, it was created before, but it, it, it scales and exacerbates the problem, can also be part of the solution. Can you say, Maya, where more places where you think AI will be the solution to some of these super intractable long-term problems that we've had um, very little success in actually um, you know, addressing? Well, if you were to ask the folks at Microsoft and Google, they'd say uh, the environmental issues. But the same, like the, one of the biggest challenges of AI and big data and high performance compute is the incredible amount of energy. We don't talk about, we haven't talked about the incredible amount of energy it consumes, uh, but the argument is that as well, that there may be some innovative solutions that AI is able to generate that may solve some of our um, climate uh, concerns. Not saying that it's true, <laughs> but... Uh, besides health equity and, and health care in and of itself, precision performance medicine. So, and also water, consumes a lot of water as well. Yeah. Um, so I'm uh, you know, very, very cognizant of the, the lack of, of trust that um, some companies have with policymakers in terms of the volunteer solutions that are out there. How do you make this enforceable? Yeah, I, the only way that you can make it enforceable is through regulation. I do think you, what you talked about, the use case approach within healthcare, there is an incredible opportunity for HHS and the various HHS, HHS agencies to use the executive um, orders that they've been given uh, to actually implement um, regulation that are very targeted. So ONC has done a great job where they now their proposed rule has become a final rule um, by which EHRs um, are required to have certain checks and balances in place when it comes to AI systems. Um, it will be the FDA is moving in a similar direction when it comes to software as a medical device. They have guidelines right now. And many of, much, much of pharma are already adopting some of these guidelines when they are using software as a medical device. Um, a lot of healthcare tech companies want to be FDA certified as a marker of good uh, citizenship. Um, so similar to uh, you know, in environmentalism, to be 
a good environmental partner. And so I think that there is possible an op opportunity at that um, very targeted HHS um, agency level uh, to have meaningful regulation sooner rather than later. All right, well, um, we're gonna transition to a, a, a moderated Q&A and then an open Q&A, but actually um, I, I wanted to, to um, because Laura, you, you stole one of my questions around the uh, positive uh, uses of AI for addressing inequity um, as opposed to exacerbating it. And for me, my favorite example is actually also from uh, Ziad Obermeyer and Emmett Pearson um, around um, predicting pain from an X-ray image of, uh, of a knee film. And so um, everyone knows Ziad's work around the, um, uh, the, the algorithm around case management that was biased, but he also uh, did another study that I, I loved, which is they simply trained an algorithm to predict a patient's subjective report of pain, um, which they happened to be able to collect. And what they found were that uh, human radiologists uh, were very biased in identifying or accurately assessing pain in black patients. It's partly because they were trained on kind of um, severity levels of osteoarthritis based on you know, traditional cohorts of patients in the past. And the AI algorithm were, were not biased by those same uh, training approaches. And so they were just much better at accurately predicting um, subjective pain in black patients than human radiologists were. And so in the same way, I mean, the AI is uh, intrinsically, you know, it's as biased as we want it to be. And so a lot of it is in the problem definition. But, but there are a lot of examples there if you're training towards outcomes as opposed to training towards human uh, interpretation that you can actually get less biased results. Um, but let's, let's transition, um, or people may have thoughts on that comment. <clears throat> All right, okay. Um, so, Tom, I have a question around um, regulatory burden. And, and Laura, you actually mentioned this in your, in your remarks, this, this concern that, um, yes, we need regulation, we need guardrails here, um, but if the burden is a little bit too high, it's one thing for Kaiser Permanente. I mean, we've got a lot of people, we've got just tons of expertise when it comes to compliance, when it comes to legal, um, uh, legal functions, when it comes to the technical expertise. So, you know, we're welcome. Uh, we're, we're happy to kind of, you know, to excel in those environments. But I worry about what Laura was describing. You know, care oftentimes happens in the non, you know, Mayos or Stanfords or Dukes of the world. Um, how do we provide policy solutions that work for them, that, that doesn't actually kind of create the system of AI haves and have nots? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think it kind of gets to the heart of the debate currently with this. Um, you know, uh, the, the, the folks that are incumbent dominant players in this space and the folks that represent industries that are already highly regulated, they know how to approach these things. They know how to either create uh, products that meet compliance or uh, you know, com that are uh, catered towards the regulatory environment that they're in. And the smaller folks and the, um, the ones that are startups, they don't have either the capital or the expertise on staff. And so that is a debate that happens quite often is, you know, how do you make sure that you are addressing some of these issues around, um, you know, very real negative externalities, while at the same time not favoring the big incumbents and the regulatory folks that are in the space? And I think that's really hard to do. Um, I, I, you know, I, I struggle with that question quite often, uh, but I also struggle with the conversation of, you know, what we would, what would happen if we don't do anything, right? And so if we completely ignore this idea and kind of embrace uh, non-regulation as the fuel for innovation, well, then we get in some negative use cases around, um, you know, in, not going to name names, but insurance companies unit for uh, end-of-life care, whatever it might be. And that, that was a really bad outcome um, that uh, I think drives the, the policy questions around, well, we can't do nothing. Um, one area that I think we can look at is, uh, a lot of tech companies, they don't want to be the ones that come out and say, this is what we need to do in this space. Uh, same with, you know, healthcare, I imagine, I'm, though I'm not a healthcare guy. Um, and they want to codify what they're already doing because they build processes and teams around what they're already doing. And if they can standardize that, then that means that they can standardize it for 
uh, a lot. I think they can mitimate, minim minimize some of the risks that they have in that space. And I think there's something to be said about that when it comes to the voluntary commitments that a lot of folks have already talked about. The White House came out on what NIST is doing and uh, the huge amount of, uh, of support that's happened there. And so there are kind of these indicators of, you know, uh, different regulatory practices that won't inhibit further development of this. Laura. Um, I would love to see, when we think about when we needed EHRs to get implemented, I mean, Economist Magazine had ranked us second only to mining, healthcare, second only to mining for lack of investment in health IT. You know, we liked technology. We can look in every molecule of the human body. We just couldn't get your lab test across the street, even if your life depended on it. So when I think about the approach that federal government used at that time, it was to ask ONC to put together, and they, we put together this in the High Tech Act. Let every single solitary physician provider out there got up to $63,000 per provider to do the transition, to do what it took to get up to speed, to understand, to acquire technology, and do those things. And we also had things put together under that same act called the Regional Extension Centers. You know, um, these are the, like in agriculture where you go out and you help small farmers understand the newest technologies, the newest science to go on with things. I think we need to begin to replicate that and put that back in place for all of the places that do not have the resources. Create regional collaborations, create vaults and banks where we can start to see how algorithms are functioning in critical access hospitals, create communication nexus where they can begin to share. I loved what Julia said about we're working with some other healthcare facility over here. They're going to be testing and trying this one. We're going to test and try this one over here, and then we're going to combine our learning. Let's do that at scale, and let's do it directed toward those that do not have the, um, the resources to do it. I think we can replicate the regional extension centers and really take a run at this. What about you, Maya? Yeah, I love that idea of uh, recreating the, the High Tech Act because I was a primary care doctor in private practice um, when we implemented the EHRs, and I got one of those cool checks. Like It was like literally like $30,000 at the end of the year, and I was like, cha-ching. <laughs> I was already over my, my margin for the year. When you're in private practice, you know, every dollar counts, so definitely re recall that. Uh, but I do think that there is plenty of opportunity to, again, align, um, say, HHS with whether it's meaningful use ONC and meaningful use type of an approach or just plain CMS and CMMI having some sort of um, incentivized projects and uh, innovation projects around appropriate responsible AI implementation. I think there's plenty of opportunity for both uh, some sort of carrot versus stick approach and definitely starting with carrots that has always been very helpful in healthcare was when they start with carrots incentives and then you know by the time 10 15 years goes around by uh, the penalties start kicking in uh, but there's plenty of frameworks that HHS and ONC and um, you know unit CMS can use as examples and frame similar type of policy and incentives. My next question actually goes uh, back to you, Maya. Um, the last time that we met, you were still at the University of Chicago yes. um, as the EVP and Chief Digital Transformation Officer there. Um, you've since gone, you know, and, and um, full-time into this startup. Um, and you talk about the importance of, of AI governance um, and getting this right. And so it's a bit of a meta question, but can you simulate the conversation between Maya, the physician executive, that has tight margins, that are just coming out of COVID, and, you know, we're told to cut costs, and, um, and then, you know, Maya, the, 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 the startup CEO that's trying to sell into University of Chicago um, of why we need this. What, what does that conversation look like? We could probably, I don't know, simulate that in ChatGPT as well, but... <laughs> I think the, the conversation really is, okay, what's keeping you up at night? And I've spoken to many healthcare IT leaders, and what's keeping them up at night, at night is the loss of um, focus on health equity. The sense that we've lost, that the demand for increased productivity and decreased cost has taken away from the overarching mission. If you ask healthcare IT leaders, those that were in the throes of the pandemic, that had this huge rallying cry with purpose around the pandemic and health equity. Now it feels like we've made this about shift 
and no longer is equity and uh, quality and all the rest of the mission so important, but we have to drive down costs and increase productivity. We need another tool that's going to help our providers you know, see more patients, or that's not, sometimes it's, it's spun as, you know, a wellness tool, uh, but in the back of the head is like how we're going to pay for it, um, which usually means increased productivity. So what I, my conversation to the, uh, the executive me is, wouldn't there, there is a possibility for aligning that your health equity and quality and patient experience mission that has always been part of our mission with AI without the AI being a detractor and just about increasing productivity, decreasing costs, and potentially uh, the, the cost of some of our employees. That there is this bright side if we make these choices around you know, setting up our AI strategy in the very beginning to align with health equity, that we continue to have, that we have the AI governance, which AI yeah, governance is just a fancy word for clinical decision support governance. You already have clinical decision support governance. Now you just need a few extra experts, <laughs> uh, but it's not that much different. And then um, really making sure that you're measuring. So uh, that's the conversation that I have is... <laughs> That, that you're having in your own head. In my own head is, how do you get the joy back for the poor IT people? Everyone talk about the joy of medicine for the clinicians. Believe me, our IT teams are so tired. They are, they've been uh, you know, adapting to change for the last four years nonstop. Uh, the clinicians were the heroes, but in the back end, the IT teams were basically duplicating, creating whole hospitals, whole health systems uh, digitally. And so... Of course, I got to hear that because these are my team members, and yet nobody was, you know, waving the hero flag for our IT team. Uh, but they too have been through a lot in the last five years. Right. I saw a meme yesterday. It was clearly a, maybe an 80-year-old gentleman's picture, and it said, you know. Um, IT is the fun, exciting place to be, you know, like Mark, 28, you know, years old. And clearly this was a picture of an 80-year-old man, and they were assuming this was a 25-year-old person making this statement. So there was a, the picture about that. I think you're bringing up something really critical that we, we would remiss to close out a conference like this without talking about how are we incented. Because I have heard people say we can't wait to use nuance, a bridge, whatever, ambi the ambient, picking it up. Uh, and being able to reduce the provider time. And the providers are whispering, yeah, so they'll add more people to our panel. Um, that we're not going to save more time, spend more time with our patients. This is not happening. Um, the thing that um, why I will drop everything and speak at a Kaiser conference above all is because you have the payment model figured out for your patients. Um, I wish I lived near where my family could be cared for by Kaiser because I worry so much about our incentive model. The reason I worry about it is because um, it isn't aligned with the patient's best interest like Kaiser's is. You're self-contained, you're, you're integrated, you've got it all. Payer all the way through to delivery. When I think about, I was in Rhode Island and at our health information exchange, we were able to build capabilities onto that system where we could identify and notify a provider in real time in the primary care setting that your patient has gone in or out of any hospital in any state uh, any part of the state in Rhode Island or in and out of any ED. They could give us their high-risk panels and say, track these people so our care managers know in a nanosecond. We watched people be able to be healthier, be kept out of the hospital, get things prevented. And one of my CEOs in, a, in that state shut it off. And so when I went to see him, I sat down and I said, hey, um, John, <laughs> you shut off the system. Why did you shut it off? And he said, um, I had to, Laura, because it works. He said, the system keeps these patients out of the hospital. And he said, frankly, I run the whole health system, and I can't keep my hospital open unless those people are sick and admitted. He said, so I've got to have them sick so I can have that revenue from the admission so I can keep the other services going. He didn't say that with a blank look on his face or with a half smile on his face. He said it with anguish on his face. And my sense is that we do have a health incentive system here that doesn't set us up to do the best outside of Kaiser because you, again, have your incentives aligned. The rest of the world doesn't, and I don't think AI is any solution for that. 
I think we've got to take that on head on. Maybe AI can help us with that, but it's no magic bullet for it. Um, we've got to summon the will to move toward value-based payments models a whole lot faster than we already are. I, I, can, I can look at it, you know, Tony, and like, we're definitely inviting Laura to the next panel discussion. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll drop everything and show up because uh, yeah. I want everybody uh, to be aligned like you are. Thank you. Well, well, let me open it up to the audience Q&A. I think it's come up a few times today, like can we get access to broader, better data sets um, and that can be sort of available to anyone that wants to build a model and, and train a model on it. It's, I know it's just one of the steps along the way, but it feels like a really important one. And so could you just comment on the pathway to that endpoint? Like what would it take for Kaiser to share all their data with anyone that wants to develop a model on it? Um, and is regulation the only way to get there or do you see any sort of private sector models that might get us there? I mean, maybe I guess I'll start in, in my KP role. Um, you know, what really attracted me to KP, and I think many people here as well, is, I mean, we do really have quite remarkable um, data sets. Vivian spoke about them. And one of the things that I learned about KP is that um, not only do we have deep and broad data, we have longitudinal data. You know, the average Kaiser member stays with us for 11 years. And so when you're really trying to look at outcomes, we've got that outcome data. Um, so one is, as uh, Laura mentioned, there's, a, there's a, another event, the Coalition for Health AI, and this whole concept of quality assurance labs, and um, you know, how do we build the wire cutter or the consumer reports for AI in an independent kind of third-party validator service. Um, when I look at the organizations that are lining up to, to fill that role, I see the usual suspects, you know, Mayo, Stanford, probably UCSF is on that short list. Um, I think KP is a great place to play. Um, um, you know, I need to make the case internally that we could, but uh, when I think about a lot of the issues around diversity of data sets, we, we've got that. You know, our 12.5 million members across eight states um, uh, and the depth of the data we have uh, looks a lot more like the rest of America than Palo Alto does. Uh, you know, and Stanford delivers great care, but it just it doesn't look like the care we deliver in Oakland or the populations that we care for there. So, um, you know, I, I, but Kaiser is just one healthcare system. I think there are others, um, um, you know, that similarly reflect that diversity. I would love to see county health systems and rural hospitals contributing data. Um, and so if I put my Moore Foundation hat on, we were funding in that space. Um, and so just to give you one example, we gave a grant to uh, Contra Costa County, uh, their health system, to, uh, uh, make their EKG data available for public use. And it took one year for the data use agreement to get signed. Um, so of our grant dollars, not a single dollar was spent because they've never signed a data use sharing agreement. They didn't even know the lawyer that had the authority to sign it. And so I do think that there are huge, almost infrastructural gaps around making data available. It's easy to talk about it from the stage that health systems should be contributing their data. I think the challenge really is that, you know, the academic medical centers, there is very much an intrinsic motivation for making their data AI ready, for doing research on it. We don't have that necessarily in the other care delivery systems. And so I'd love to see us move forward, but, but I, I do think that there are big structural issues that stand in the way. I think that um, it's going to become infinitely easier to get a hold of data sets soon, but only if you have money. Um, Peter Lee, at a recent uh, conference that we had with Harvard, was on a panel with me, and he said, here's what I see for the future. Hospitals haven't had a very good opportunity to monetize the, the data that they have, and that was pre-AI. Um, all bets are off now that this is going to become suddenly super valuable data for those. It'll become, from the hospital's point of view, oh, my God, do I have a revenue stream here? And I think that I, I think back to Michael Millinson's point that uh, if data is the new oil, then patient rights and privacy is climate change. And I, I think we're coming up on an era where we're going to see a shift in that for money. And, and I'm, I'm very, very worried about the imbalance and how that will play out. Uh, because I do think that's going to be a suddenly an issue for patient privacy rights where organizations are will, going to be willing to give up because they, they're, they're dying for the resources that they need. And um, we've got a lot of conversations to be had in that arena before that future comes. And it's soon. 
Absolutely. And I think we need to remember that each data point in healthcare is the digital representation of a person's experience. Yeah. Right? So who really owns the data? And health systems were just fiduciary you know, managers of patient, individual patient data. And so until we figure out how to actually adequately protect um, a patient's privacy or their patient's wishes when it comes to their data, I think we're going to have, you know, whether you call them structural barriers, but um, I also think that there are protections, right, for who really is uh, the owner of that data when it's your digital twin. Yeah, um, I'm not a healthcare guy, so I might butcher this, but, um, you know, I, I was thinking about that in terms of digital twinning and, you know, the, the case of Henrietta Lacks um, mm -hmm. and, you yep. know, the fact that the family took generations to get a retribution for that. What does that mean in the space of a digital health world where, um, you, know, you know, it might not be one person, it might be multiple thousands of people that uh, ultimately have their data used for some out long term outcome? Yeah, I think the flip side, though, um, you know, one of my colleagues at KP, Vinnie Liu, loves to say, not an ounce of data wasted. Um, and so, you know, our patients entrust us with this healthcare data, um, but they also entrust that we're learning from it, and they're, we're using it for good purpose as well. And so um, I think most of our patients, uh, again, if we were to survey them, would say, please, like, we want to advance care delivery. We want to advance mm -hmm. the state of the art. We want better care for ourselves. I want more personalized care. Use my data to make my care more personalized. So I, I think there's always a double-edged sword. We certainly care about privacy. We certainly care about data rights. Um, I also think that, that um, you know, our patients are expecting us in some ways to really make sure that we're um, um, leveraging this precious resource for greatest impact. Absolutely, and that would become through consent consent as well, as well as transparency, yeah. right? So if you have the systems in place, then you can definitely ensure that you're appropriately using the uh, data that has been consented to for that use. Totally and discovery agree. is part of that. Yeah, totally agree. It's like donating blood, <laughs> you know? It's just doing good for the system and doing good for the whole. All right. Well, with that, um, we're going to close. Oh. Oh, okay. I was just going to make one comment on yes. this. And, um, I really appreciate all of the comments around this last question, and, and Julie, your question about this, which is a really, really important policy question. We've, we've, had a number, we've had a large number of sessions in this space that the Institute has put on around drug pricing. And at the central, and, and there's a whole bunch of really identifiable reasons why we have problems with drug pricing. And, uh, a root of a lot of that is the failure to think through the economic model of technology transfer and what's happened through universities to private ownership of the goods that come out of that to how it's then on the market. I would suggest, Daniel, and maybe you and I can both have this conversation with our colleagues, um, there's policy to do in this space. How do we take this, this good, which is this data, and how can we make sure that it is used exactly the right way and doesn't create a kind, a, you know, a private ring fence that then winds up being things where people start not doing things because they haven't solved the intellectual property problem. Um, so, you know, how long it takes contracts to be signed. I mean, th these are all the same problem, and it's something that all of us, I think, can work on together and think, if we think of it as a policy problem before somebody puts a solution forward that creates a reality we'll be living with for another 50 years. So I think, excellent question, lots to do in this space. Thank you. Christine. All right, well, um, great comment. Seems like maybe a, a potential uh, topic for the next uh, IHP meeting. Um, but I want to thank my panelists here for your great remarks and insights. Thank you. Thank you.